Ready. And the actual skeleton. So damage this poor little joint, and everything will hurt. Because everything, every bit of weight that is attached to that arm is pulling down on that joint. So individuals who damage an SC joint, individuals who damage the AC joint out here. So either one of them will typically present carrying, cradling, holding the weight of that limb with their opposite side. Simple enough? Okay. There's an articular disc that lives in actually the ends of this bone. So within the sternoclavicular joint, there's an articular disc buried inside. Within the acromioclavicular joint, there's a disc that buries in there. And then each of them is going to be surrounded by a joint capsule, synovial fluid, all that good happy stuff. We'll go back through the ligaments later. Um, what motions do we get out of this thing? The clavicle, specifically the sternoclavicular joint. What's it do? You don't think about that much because it's kind of it's it's, it's it's in there, so we don't tend to think about it a whole lot. So elevation depression, the principal actions that we get. So we go and sit that on top, and it's going to give us a lot of rocking that gives us elevation depression. But beyond that, we can protract and retract. So you can tip your shoulder forward, and it's going to pivot forward, and then you can pull it back. And then, so if you put your hand on your clavicle, and then you kind of rotate your arm, so internally rotate and tip that scapula forward, you can actually feel it twist and rotate under your fingers. So we have elevation depression, protraction, retraction, and rotation, because it will rotate a little bit more. So when we come back through, we'll go through some of the specifics of the combinations of movements that we get out of these, because the glenohumeral joint that makes up your shoulder is this pretty involved communication of the humerus articulating with the scapula. The scapula has its own movement patterns by the muscles that stabilize it. Both of those hinge initially at the acromioclavicular joint, which then hinges at the sternoclavicular joint. So to get shoulder abduction of 180 degrees, we actually have three different joints that have to work in concert. So there's a lot going on that makes the shoulder fairly complex. And then you have to go and add in this thing that we are that we call the, the scapulothoracic articulation, which isn't so much a joint, but it's 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 a, it's a a balance of the control of the muscles that hold that scapula in place as it moves around the thoracic cage, around the ribs. So quite a bit to deal with. Um, so Proximal end, the first two thirds is convex, it points out and then it dips into a concavity as it then gives you a nice big flat end which marries up with the flat end of the acromium on the scapula. So that side, that side, so they get stuck together like that. So they kind of just bun up each other. Now, the stabilization that's created is pretty poor. I mean, if I just stick these two bones, it's, it's a gliding joint as I stick the two, the, the chromium end with the clavicle. If I slide those in, then, well, I guess more like right in there. Oops, hold on. Right in there. I gotta get it right eventually. There we go. So, um, I mean, they kind of just rub up against each other rather than being anything that's anchored, say, like your ball and socket of your femur, femoral head into your acetabulum. So, fragile, delicate on some levels, stabilized in other places, we'll get to the ligaments that go. Uh, the main thing I want to do from this point is really kind of reinforce the landmarks that we're going to have with this to help give you an assessment point and a reference point when we start putting the pictures back on to put the muscles in place. So the point here, we're going to go, let's go ahead and start working on uh, some palpation with each other to find these locations um, to kind of help make it a little bit more real. Fair enough? So the way we'll start is seated because we will start from the neck musculature to find our way into finding these locations. It's a lovely smile. 
<laughs> well, help me out, actually. So, let's um. Let's pivot a table to where it's easier kind of get through this ridiculous maze that exists here. Um, so I'm gonna. There's fewer computers on this. I'm gonna move. Uh, we'll move these. Yeah, because I All right, um, and then if you guys can move the table so I can get kind of back and forth between you guys a little faster and easier than having a wee bit of She's just throw it on top of it. Actually, put it on the table. That is it. Okay, so find your partner, find your buddy. So let's start with shrug the shoulders. Because that presents what muscle to us very easily? Trapezius, right? So shrug the shoulders, find the traps, get your hands over it. Find that origin up in the occiput. So feel those traps and that fibers all the way up in the occiput. As soon as you do, they can relax. Now from that, we have those two kind of vertical cords that are sitting on either side of the spinous processes. If we go a little bit lateral from that origin at the occiput, so we go on the superior nuchal line and go up the sides, then we hit what muscle that's peeking out? So what's coming? Way up in here, we have trapezius that come up. What's sitting in that space right in here? Splenius capitis, right? If we go just a touch more forward, then you're finding the mastoid process, which gives us what muscle? SCM, sternocleidomastoid. What are you trying to put? You want the masseter? I don't know. Here you go. I don't know where I was going with that. Whatever. I don't know what this was. So, trapezius, upper traps, splenius capitis, find SCM. So, how do you get SCM to present itself? How do you get it to be pronounced? <laughs> So if I want it, if I want the right side sternocleidomastoid to present, then how do I have them move their head? So turn to the left, right ear to that shoulder. So take that ear like you're trying to reach down towards your sternum. And if you give a little bit of resistance, then it'll pop out. 
Okay. Got it? So follow that muscle down into, so sternocleidomastoid means that from the mastoid where we started, going through it backwards, it's leading me to the sternum and the clido, which is our lovely term for the clavicle. Okay? So SCM is coming down in here. So from that point, I want you actually to feel the sternoclavicular joint. So feel where that clavicle comes into the manubrium at the sternum. With me? Nobody's getting cold. This one's the I'm like holding her. I'm like holding her All right, so if you have any kind of rotation, if things are skeletally rotated, you may very easily have one more presented than the other. Not a huge issue, but you can kind of feel where that, again, that clavicle rides up on that, that saddle joint. There's a disc hiding inside there. Now, if you have them AB ducked, you can feel that clavicle at that sternum shift a little bit. The majority of that motion of the clavicle is going to happen at the sternoclavicular joint. It's going to happen in the first 90 degrees. You're going to get about 20 degrees of elevation as you AB duck to 90. Now, as you go above that, you're going to get more degrees of motion at the AC joint distal. And we'll cover that a little bit better next time. So as you come up the first 90, you're going to get elevation on the clavicle uh, at the SC joint. And when you go up to 180, that second 90 degrees, you're going to get more elevation at the AC joint as we start cranking on. There's only one muscle that directly acts on the clavicle. Underneath, you've got the subclavius muscle. So if you find the clavicle go underneath it, hiding under there, and there's a lovely little landmark called the groove for the subclavius, cleverly, conveniently, there's a muscle <laughs> called the subclavius. And it's sub underneath the clavius, the clavicle. We're good to go. Not so hard. <laughs> it's about the only muscle that we directly have acting on the clavicle. Everything else is cranking on it from the scapula from the glenoid. So the glenoid moves, it pushes the scapula, the scapula moves, and it's going to crank on the clavicle. Cool? Yeah. Cool. Good stuff. Okay. Now, likewise, feel to where if you rotate forward, you can feel that clavicle rotate. You can kind of tip that scapula to where you drop, try to lean the shoulder forward. You can also do protraction, <laughs> reaching forward, and retraction, pulling back, and you can feel its movements. It moves quite, it can pivot quite a bit, 15 to 30 degrees, depending upon um, the resource you're looking at. All right, so from that, we're feeling at this SC joint, we're going to feel that first two thirds is that convexity, that outward bowing before it goes into a concavity inward, uh, that distal third. Most fractures are occurring in that middle third. What's the head position for somebody who's got a clavicle fracture? So we're going to shorten that SCM. So just like you're trying to get it to contract where you resist that motion, they're going to put the ear rotated. They're going to turn their face away from the injured side and drop their ear down. Because that shortens the SCM, which takes the pressure off of that, the fracture set, off that bone. Okay. Now, when we do have injuries to the SC joint, clavicle fracture, Anterior is more common, and posterior is a bigger concern. If it goes posterior, there's so many nerves, arteries, veins flowing in underneath this space that if you've got a posterior dislocation, then we're having a bad day. The SC joint, if you have a posterior dislocation of the clavicle, then it's actually going to impinge upon the esophagus. That person's going to be a little unhappy. So... Um, <coughs> All right, hands back on, find the convexity, follow back into that concavity where it flattens out and becomes a flatter surface. And then you're going to work your way into the AC joint where the clavicle and the distal end articulates with the acromion process of the scapula.
Right. So this joint, or the AC, the AC joint, so it's a, there's an injury called a separated shoulder, an AC sprain, and it's damaging the ligaments that stabilize the undersurface of this, probably the AC joint capsule itself, but more specifically the, the corpoclavicular ligament, and again, we'll get to ligaments later. But it's a tether, it holds it down. So again, we elevate like this, and then we bring it back down in assistance with the subclavius, and it holds it down. But if we damage this ligament set, then it pops up, much the way we call it the piano key sign. So if you go and you push a piano key, and it goes down, and you let go, and it pops back up, hey, your clavicle will do the same cool trick. So it pops up, and then you push it down, and then you let go, and it goes ding, and it sits back up. So grade one, not that big of a deal. Grade two, yeah, you're definitely getting a cool piano key sign. Grade three, it's sticking way up. There's also all kinds of like four, five, six through like 92. Not that many, but you're going to start getting in past the grade three into fracture locations, which are going to crack it all along and around the, uh, the ligaments. Grading systems that are well beyond what we have to fuss with, they're going to be repaired by orthopedic stuff. All right, so if you then come and find from that point, you find the AC joint, you're going to follow that acromium around, and it blends into or it's created from the spine of the scapula. So you can find that rigidity of the spine of the scapula as it, as it flows over the back. Now, if you want to make your person happy, find the spine of the scapula. If you don't like them, stick on. Uh, there's muscle that fills in this spacing right through here. So this is the spine. Above it is the supraspinous fossa, above the spine fossa. Below it is the infraspinous fossa. You take your hands, and much like a piano, just like kind of work your way right over the top and right over either one of those fosses, and, and you've probably made a friend for at least the next 30 seconds. <laughs> cool? All right. So let's try to find some stuff. Um, let's try to find the rest of the scapula. From this position, with the shoulders rounded, it tends to be a bit difficult to find much of anything. So let's get people lying down so we can kind of poke and prod and, and force them to be in positions that we want them to be in. <laughs> so we're going to start with deep pressure points first. <laughs> <laughs> this class will not be will not be appropriately done until somebody's coming out with tears in their eyes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> first things first is oh see I I go and move tables so I can get around you people easier. I'm gonna go move them back so I can help find stuff. All right. First things first is we're gonna. Fine, you can like well, we can go back in and you can find that spinous the uh, the spine of the scapula first. It's fairly presented, you found it already in our attack. If you hadn't done that before and you wanted an easier way to find it, then take the person's arm or have them take their arm and tuck it behind their back. In doing so, the medial border of the scapula will pop out considerably. Now, it's different from person to person. If you get somebody who is exceptionally, well, strong, somebody who's got a lot of muscular definition, then it tends not to present quite so much. Gymnasts tend not to present quite so much. Swimmers? Well, they're all thrown, so she's kind of <laughs> So, yeah, you get that medial border coming right out through here, sticking way up. Everybody got it? Have the medial border. Now, from that medial border, you can actually, so uh, make sure when they're in that position that they're not struggling to hold it there, that they're not actively holding it, that it's rested and relaxed. So sometimes if you take the weight of their arms, it makes sure they're relaxed, and then you can find it easier. So she presents well, but you can also see how it's staying really flat. So it means that, it's, again, there's a lot of strength, but it's a lot of musculature that's kind of hiding and covering that up. Now, you can, at that point, in most people, and get your fingers up underneath that scapula so you can pull it in. Just feels weird. Yeah. It doesn't bug people, it just looks and feels weird. 
Now my son, you can get, you can actually grab his entire schedule and not remove it off the bottom. <laughs> So what are we grabbing underneath? If we can get underneath that, what's under there? Subscapularis. It's a subscapular fossa. Got it? We need a whole thing right there. See, here we go. That's what we're looking for. So it lets me get completely underneath that scapula. As long as she relaxes enough, you should be able to get it. It doesn't hurt. It just feels weird, right? Yeah. yeah. It doesn't hurt. It just feels weird. That's cool. That's cool. You're freaking me out, man. All right. Yeah, completely. Yeah. So you'll find that people who have really tight rhomboids, and we'll get to those in the very near future. Uh, those muscles go from the spinous processes out to the medial border of the, of the scapula. If those are really tight, then you're not going to be able to get underneath. So if you've got somebody who's got dysfunction to where there's an imbalance in the muscles that stabilize the scap, you can find that that rhomboid tension, that rhomboid tightness, is actually indicative of there being a bigger problem. Okay? All right, so medial border, work your way inferiorly to the inferior angle. So you've got it presented. You've got your medial border right through here. So work your fingers down to where you can find that bottom inferior angle. And at that point, you may get them to kind of relax the arm and just put it to the side. Once you've found that inferior angle, if you lose it, feel free to just put their arm back up to refine again. But getting them to relax down by their side a bit more is going to make it easier to find the lateral border. Because we want to take that medial border, find the inferior angle, and then start working our way up that lateral border. So when you find that inferior angle, if you kind of put your hand like this in a V shape, you can kind of cradle that inferior angle and you'll be able to feel where that bone is. You'll be able to feel where that border is in the medial omega, or that lateral border. All right. Next piece we're going to find is a little landmark called the infraglenoid tubercle. So break those words apart. The glenoid is that articular surface. The glenohumeral, the glenoid is that articular surface on the scapula. So infra means below, glenoid, below the glenoid, tubercle, bump. So this is the origination point of the triceps long head. So it comes off just below the joint line itself. So to do that, we're going to go and find, gonna find that lateral border, and then you're going to follow it up just until you start feeling that neck swelling out, the, the scapular neck swelling out, right before you get all the way up into the joint space. And there's a little bit of a tender spot that's going to be right up in there. Find it? Is that tender? Yeah. Just check it. Okay. So I got the right spot. But you'll notice that that spot is in line with the trapezius muscle. So it's about mid shaft of the arm. As you go just off of that, but coming right up through there. So it's that. Uh, the tubercle, lateral border right up underneath that glenoid, and she will feel it as a pretty significant tender spot. You'll feel it as more of that neck swelling up. Right. 
Find a lot of water. So, take their arm. Uh, well, take their arm. Tuck it back. Put your put your hand on. Put your hand on the inferior angle again. So make sure you find it. Once you find it, once you get your hand on that inferior angle, then bring their arm up over their head. Now you'll feel that. That, that scapula is rotating underneath your hand. It's pivoting as it moves forward as you move their arm up and over. So you're going from an adducted position to an abducted position, so it will shift and rotate. So don't lose it in the process of moving. Okay, so what we're going to do is, from that inferior angle, well, let's, let's, uh, let's take a breath real quick. Um, Spine of the scapula. We can go, you can find medial border with the arms tucked in. From that medial border, you can work your way up to find the spine of the scapula. The superior angle is deep and somewhat hidden, so we can't really get to it. But we can definitely feel the spine of the scapula as it comes off that medial border. So again, from this position, we can still find the infraspinous fossa and the supraspinous fossa. Yay, happy piano key fingers, make people happy. Good? Okay, so. We have then grabbed in that subscapular fossa when we got underneath from the medial side as well. These are large land masses, much like you see on the pelvis, on the iliac crest, on the anterior and posterior sides. What fills on the iliac crest? What fills in that space? Muscles. Iliac, the, the anterior side, we've got the iliacus. The, the posterior side, we've got um, glute med, glute min. And then glute max riding over the top. Same idea here. This, these fossas are covered with muscle. Take a stab at what muscles are in there. So conveniently, these aren't meant to be tricky. So spine of the scapula, above it is the supraspinous fossa. The muscle is called the supraspinatus. Brilliant. I know. It's, I love it when it works out. Spine of the scapula, below it, infraspinous fossa, infraspinatus muscle. Or two for two on easy. Underside, subscapular fossa, subscapularis. Three for three on easy. So these three are three of the four muscles that make up your rotator cuff. I imagine you've heard of the rotator cuff at some point in your life. It rotates your shoulder, among other things. Okay? There is a fourth rotator cuff muscle. So if we had above the spine was supraspinatus, below the spine was 
infraspinatus on the anterior portion of subscapularis, then it only makes sense that the fourth rotator cuff muscle is called teres minor. Clearly. Mm -hmm. Clearly. Mm -hmm. All right. Then if we have a minor, there's probably a major. Not a rotator cuff muscle, but we can find it easier first. So arm in the back, get the medial border to present, cradle the inferior angle again. And so in your position where your thumb is, off the inferior angle is Terry's major. And it goes up towards that arm. So if you get that arm up in front, so go ahead and put the arm, um, once you find it and cradle it, get them to put that arm up and above. Then from that landmark, you'll be able to find a muscle that comes right across your hand. <laughs> so right in between here, that inferior angle. So we're going to find that muscle right up in there. So you put your finger right there, and you're going to find it. Good? We good with that one? Terry's major? We'll find that it's Terry's major. All right, now, midway, about a third of the way to half the way up the lateral border of the scapula. So again, cradle it. So about halfway up your finger on that lateral border is where Terry's minor originates. So major's off the inferior angle, minor's off the lateral border. So if you follow that path, if you find the inferior angle and you can feel where Terry's major rolls up, and then go halfway up that lateral border, and then follow that line up towards the humerus, you'll be able to find another core a little bit higher up. Y'all good? No? coming from higher up. So yeah. minor is, so major is this direction, minor is this direction. So again, minor is going to go to that greater tuberosity, and the insert there, which is the greater tuberosity is rotator cuff insertion point. Okay? So this one is just doing that short length, and this one's doing that long. Which is why if you put their hand over their arm, it's stretching it to where you can just feel that, that tight bring it down and short that you're not going to feel it as easily. Good stuff so far? Yeah. Ah, that's great. Alright, why don't you switch partners so your partner can palpate and push and prod on you. And then I, I came back and I made coffee and I got the kids to school. 
and I realized I didn't have anything else to do until 10 o'clock. <laughs> so I went back to sleep. I wasn't even a nap, I was done. The only thing that woke me up was the fact that my dog wouldn't stop barking. <laughs> he and I about got in a fight. <laughs> so, sleep fixed things where coffee did not. All right, so let's start that pathway again. You can find, find the scab if you like, or you can get them to present their arm by putting it in really rotated and behind them. Get that medial border to present. So from that medial border, we want to go and palpate inferiorly down to the inferior angle. And then we can come up and around the outside to find the lateral border. Remember, following up that lateral border, just as that neck begins to swell outward on the scapula right before you get to the glenoid, if you walk your fingers until you get close, and then right where you think it is, just rub them, like move the, move, stay in one spot on the skin, but shift the skin over the bone, and you can feel where that landmark is, or closer to that landmark for the infraglenoid tubercle. Next piece, medial border, walk it superiorly so you can find that spine of the scapula again. From that spine, we're going to go above and below to find the supraspinous fossa, the supraspinous muscle, and the infraspinous fossa, the infraspinous. So medial border, go superior so you can find the spine of the scap, which is the most prominent. What's important about the spine of the scapula? What's important about the spine of the scapula? I mean, if we've got big, massive, bony landmarks, there's typically something anchored on them. That's kind of a big, massive, bony landmark. So what's anchored on it? A muscle. The inferior lateral Superior red neck and must the abductor. Longest. Brevis. Brevis, sorry, I had it rest. Trapezius. T traps. Occiput to T12. Come out to the spine of the scapula. Not a trick question. Okay, it's kind of a trick question. Because we only talked about traps at the spine, and all of a sudden I'm like completely flipping things around and asking you to remember where it goes. It's like, ah, what are you doing to me? I don't like this. It's awkward and I'm uncomfortable. I'm leaving. Okay, so uh, spinal scapula above it, supraspinatus below it, infraspinatus. If you want to get to subscap, you can get your hand good up and underneath. There's another way to get to a subscap, but you got to go through the armpit a little bit to kind of get there. It's really fun and exciting. <laughs> All right. What's left? Okay, so find medial border. Go down, find the inferior angle, cradle the scapula. And from there, I want you to find, take their arm and put it above their head so we can feel that teres major come off that inferior angle. Because as it starts rotating, you're going to start having issues with where that scapula goes. 
So start here so you can find that scab and then follow it as it rotates. All right, so we're trying to find it. So good, so we get that inferior angle right in there. So right there. there you go. Okay, so that point is there. Out. So there should be a muscle right there. So far? Yeah. Cool. So you found most of the rotator cuff. Kind of put your poke prod your fingers on all of it as we go. Uh, most of the bony landmarks that hit our own scapula. So from that point, um, we can't really get into the glenohumeral joint itself. So you guys can sit up because the next piece I'll have you back sitting again. But you'll notice that the acromion process serves as kind of a roof that goes over the top of the humeral head. <laughs> and then this, what's the name of this landmark? That little pinky-like projection that slides up. So it's called the coracoid process. So when asked to spell things out, this is probably the one place in the body that <coughs> it matters. Because very soon we're going to get to a landmark in the elbow called the coronoid process. So it's one letter off and it's a completely different bone, completely different landmark. Um, it's actually on the ulna, it's that piece right there. Good? Cor that's coronoid with an N. And this guy here is the coracoid with a C. Okay? Now, coracoid process. Um, okay, we'll come back to that in just a sec. But as you stick these two together, so the glenoid is very shallow. It's got a labrum that sits around it that deepens it a little bit. But from that, we get quite a bit of freedom and range of motion. All three, three degrees of freedom, lots of range of motion. This creates somewhat of a roof to where if I go up, then it's pushing against that roof, which helps create that rotation of the scapula as we go up. So the motion on the scapula, in a lot of ways, is it starts with the humerus as it drives that and pulls it and pushes it up. Now there's a lot of muscles that stabilize this and have to shift and help hold it in place. When you have somebody throwing a 105 mile an hour fastball, um, that's a lot of its focus through that glenohumeral joint, clearly. But if this, much like if the pelvis isn't stable, your glutes aren't going to work great, your glute knee specifically, if the scapula is stabilized and aren't working right, then trying to throw a 105 mile an hour fastball is like throwing, shooting a cannon out of a canoe. Fun mental image, right? I don't think it's going to go well for anybody. Um, except the person getting shot at, probably. Um, so, that acromion process comes up 
and it with the clavicle helps make a bit of a roof to that joint surface. So we really can't get up and in there. But we do, much like we have the infraglenoid tubercle, there is a supraglenoid tubercle that's going to matter quite a bit to us because it's the origination point of the biceps long hip. The biceps muscle here, the long hip's way up and underneath. Very, very good thing to remember. I'd hold on to that forever and ever and ever. Or at least until your final exams are done. So, um, but we can get to this coracoid process. So let's do that and then we'll end today. So find your person sitting in a chair. So you can get behind them again. But have them sitting a little bit to one side to where I want them to be able to extend their arm without bumping into the chair with their elbow. So have them scooch over just a hair. Or turn sideways in it. So stand behind them. And I want you to find the concavity of, of the clavicle. So the part where it bows inward. And then I want you to go about an inch, inch and a half caudally, inferiorly, downward. Now, if they're relaxed, it should be kind of a soft, squishy area. You're pushing directly over pec major coming across, pectoralis major. Sitting underneath is pec minor, because pec minor actually inserts into that coracoid process. Now, where that spot is that she's all squirreling about, extend the elbow, extend, and all of a sudden it will tip the scapula forward to where this coracoid process pops out underneath your finger. And it should be a fairly tender spot. Good? All set? Awesome. All right, so from that, in class next time, we're going to go over... We're going to go over the joints themselves with the stabilization with the ligaments, the motions they have. Um, we'll add in scapular stabilizers. We'll probably get through rotator cuff, and then that'll, that'll get us into the muscles that move the glenohumeral joint for the sake of motion. So it will be a little bit less poking and prodding on each other and a little bit more mechanic stuff on the head. Uh, if you could be so kind, stack up and take the pads back over.